Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining A Different Thanksgiving with Sam Sifton, Julia Bainbridge, Manit Chuan, Hawa Hassan, and Yossi Arifi, moderated by Jen Sit. We are so excited for tonight's conversation on a topic on everyone's minds right now, Thanksgiving. During this evening's event, we will be utilizing the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question, please feel free to ask it here, and Jen might just pull your question into the conversation. Please connect with other readers and guests using the chat function. We'd love to hear your thoughts, what you're reading, how you're taking care of yourself during this difficult time, and what you're thankful for this year. We just ask that everyone please stay respectful in the chat. Random House will also be providing the link to each of our panelists' books that are currently for sale in the chat. The event will be posted on YouTube and we will send the link out to all guests in case you would like to rewatch or share with your friends and family. On another note, Random House Special Events in partnership with Penguin Random House and Zenny has just announced Holiday House, a two night Zoom event with book recommendations, food and drink demos, raffles and featured authors, including Ina Garten, Manit Chuan, Debbie Maycomer, Claire Savitz, R.R. Thomas and more. Tickets are on sale now and the link will be provided in the chat if you're interested in joining us. Back to tonight's event though, I am honored to introduce our moderator for this evening, Jen Sit. Jen Sit is, is executive editor at Clarkson Potter where she, acquire, where she acquires and edits books in the food, drink and lifestyle space. She's edited New York Times bestsellers and IACP and James Beard Award finalists. Some of her authors include Martha Stewart, Gina Hamolka, Bobby Flay, Aldo Sam, Eating, Eating Grinspan, Yossi Arifi, and Mimi, Mimi Thorson, along with forthcoming projects from Eric Adbang um, and Korsha Wilson, Molly Baz, Natasha David, and blogger Maurizio Leo. And now, may I present Jen Sit and A Different Thanksgiving. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Katie, for that introduction. I am so excited to be moderating this panel because it is essentially the coolest Friendsgiving I've ever been invited to. And it's full of some of the most talented, brightest cookbook authors in the business, including a person who literally wrote a book on Thanksgiving. So without further ado, I'd like to bring them on to the virtual stage. First, we have Hawa Hassan. Hawa is the founder and CEO of Bas Bas Bas, a line of condiments inspired by her country of origin, Somalia. Hala and her brand have been featured in Forbes, The New York Times, The Observer, Grub Street, Vogue, The Cut, Eater, and more. She is the author with Julia Kirshen of Mbidi's Kitchen, gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, the subtitle is The Recipes and Stories of Grandmothers from the Eight African Countries That Touch the Indian Ocean. Welcome, Hala. Next, we have Manit Chuan. Mini is a James Beard award-winning chef whose restaurants include Chuan Ale in the Sala House, Tan So, The Mockingbird, and Chattable, all in Nashville. Prior to becoming an executive chef and judge on Food Network's Chopped, Mini worked in some of the finest hotels in India before moving to the U.S. to study the culinary arts. She is the author with Jodi Eddy of Chop, Recipes from the Kitchens, Markets, and Railways of India. Welcome, Manit. Thank you, excited to be here. Thank you. Next, we have Yasi Arefi. Yasi is a writer, photographer, and food stylist. She is the author of two cookbooks, Sweeter Off the Vine, Fruit Desserts for Every Season, and Snacking Cakes, Simple Treats for Any Time Cravings. I have to say, I'm a, Yasi is one of my authors, and I'm very excited about this book. Um, Yasi also writes the award-winning blog, Apartment 2B Baking Co., which celebrates seasonal baking and preserving. Her work has been featured in publications in print and online, including New York Times Cooking, Martha Stewart, Bon Appetit, Food 52, Epicurious, Good Housekeeping, and more. Hey, Yasi, so great to see you. Hi, everybody. Next, we have Julia Bainbridge. Julia is an editor who has worked at Condé Nast Traveler, Bon Appetit, Yahoo Food, and Atlanta Magazine. And she is a James Beard Award nominated writer whose stories, mainly but not exclusively about food and drink, have been published in Food and Wine, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and The New York Times, among others. Her mission is to normalize all kinds of drinking, including not drinking. She is the author of Good Drink, Alcohol Free Recipes from for when you're not drinking for whatever reason. Welcome, Julia. Hey, how are you? 
good. Good to be here. All right. And last, but certainly not least, we have Sam Sifton. Sam is an assistant managing editor of the New York Times, overseeing culture and lifestyle coverage. He is also an eat com columnist for the New York Times Magazine and the founding editor of New York Times Cooking, an award-winning digital cookbook and cooking school. Formerly the new newspaper's national news editor, culture editor, and chief restaurant critic, he's also the author of Thanksgiving, How to Cook It Well, and See You on Sunday, a cookbook for family and friends, and the forthcoming No Recipe Recipes from New York Times Cooking. Welcome, Sam. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you guys. Thank you all for being here and welcome. And really, truly, congratulations to all of you on your beautiful, gorgeous, amazing, smart cookbooks this year. It's really so impressive and, and wonderful. Um, and what is really, I think, amazing about this, aside from the fact that you are all such extremely talented and impressive authors and talents, um, is that your cookbooks, though seemingly wide-ranging from non-alcoholic drinks to East African cooking traditions to chat to snacking cakes to dinners and Sunday dinners, all of them at their core are all about having a little more of that human connection through good drinks and good food. And of course, that's what really is at the heart of Thanksgiving and what's special about it. It's it's a holiday that's so intensely focused on two things, food and family. It's not about presents, it's not about fireworks, it's about sitting around a table with the people you love and breaking bread, and your books are all really about that too. So to kick it off, I'd love to talk a little bit about tradition. Whether you grew up celebrating Thanksgiving or not, whether your Thanksgiving features a big bronze turkey or not, Thanksgiving is so much about tradition, especially the ones that you make for yourself and for your own family. And Hala, I wanna start with you because in Bibi's Kitchen, you start the book with a quote from a grandmother from South Africa who says, food is just like language. For me, stopping traditions would almost be like throwing my culture away. You go on to talk so powerfully about sustaining a cultural legacy through food and about how food and recipes keep cultures intact whether those cultures stay in the same place or are displaced. So I'd love to hear from you and then of course from everyone else about what tradition and Thanksgiving mean to you. What does it mean within the culture of your families? If you didn't celebrate Thanksgiving growing up, what new traditions have you created? And if you did celebrate Thanksgiving growing up, what's changed or remained the same? So unfortunately, unfortunately for me, I did not grow up celebrating Thanksgiving. I was born in Somalia, raised in Kenya, and then spent my formative years in Seattle, Washington. Oftentimes when I did have Thanksgiving, it was at friends' homes. And so for me, Thanksgiving was layered with foods from Ethiopia, Cambodia, Vietnam. Um, and more often than not, it was the next week at school when everybody brought potluck to school. But Thanksgiving aside, a lot of the traditions that I grew up with our, you know, communal eating, um, big celebrations that are centered around something like Eid, which is similar to Thanksgiving here in the States. Um, and so for me, food and legacy really is about being around a table and, and being around my community, being around my family, being around, um, you know, friends that I've, I've developed all over the world. And and it's not just centered on Thanksgiving, but I'm really lucky that I have this other layer of being American, which now I can introduce to my own family. Julia, would you like to go next? Sure, I guess um, food wise, it's all over the place. I think there might've always been Turkey, but um, I grew up with the Chinese grandmother or step grandmother from birth. So there was always a, you know, an element to the Thanksgiving table that had, uh, you know, ginger and garlic and soy and, and flavors from that tradition. Uh, and I don't know if it's because of that, that we've always just pr been pretty loose when it comes to the food. We're not like married to a certain, you know, there must be mashed potatoes, that kind of thing. So I think one year 
I played around with some Otolenghi influenced recipes. There was a beet puree instead of, you know, cranberry sauce. Uh, my brother is married to a Japanese woman. So a few years ago, I asked that she make nabe. So we had nabe and no turkey. <laughs> um, we always kind of play around with the food. And I guess I'm continuing with that tradition because while on Thanksgiving day itself, uh, I'm not doing much meal wise. My boyfriend who grew up, uh, he's sort of between El Paso and Juarez, the sister cities, um, we are making turkey tamales and we're driving all over the city and giving them with some mole to friends of ours. So we're gonna be the tamale fairies. I've rented a zip car for three hours and we're driving all around the boroughs. So <laughs> maybe those of you in New York can get on the list. Um, <laughs> But I guess the one thing that's consistent and that as much as I still will have a meal, I will eat. And, and perhaps I think the tradition I will stick to um, and the one thing that runs through, you know, all of this uh, sort of multiculturalness, which I guess is American, um, we, we dress up in my family and I think I will dress for the meal. So, you know, this, this isn't a day like others. This is a special time to discuss what we're thankful for and, um, and we dress to kind of honor it. Uh, it and present ourselves. That's so great, Julia. <laughs> That's so great. I love that. I think it's, I, I mean, th there is the tradition, right? Thanksgiving is a myth. Right. And, and whatever is on your table, whether it's on the table for the very first time because your sister has a new boyfriend or your father has a new wife, <laughs> It's uh, that that's okay. That's part of the holiday. We absorb it. And what I love about talking to people about this notion of a traditional Thanksgiving is that it's the tradition is different for every family. As as the white guy in the room who wrote the book on the thing, you'll see that my table looks like something out of the Norman Rockwell myth. But of course, that's not entirely true. My, my recipes have changed over time. I've cooked Thanksgiving now for more than 25 years for a large group of, of friends from all sorts of different backgrounds whose, whose food has, has become part of our Thanksgiving tradition. And that tradition has been waylaid by the coronavirus pandemic. The, I would love to, I'm gonna, for you, Julia, I'm getting dressed. I, I, I will put on a tie for Thanksgiving. I support that 100%. But I'm going to miss the tradition of gathering all of us together. Um, and I, I'd really be interested from how to hear like, you know, like, how, how do you think we can can manage like the, the, the Eid tradition wants us all together. Thanksgiving wants us all together. And we can't do that this year. It's going to be a very different thing for my family of four eating Thanksgiving. That's that's like 29 people short of what we did last year. I'm not going to lie. I'm oftentimes the person you can find washing the dishes. Like I get to parties early to help set up and then I'm the last person to leave because I'm always like trying to make sure someone's kitchen is straightened, which is the way I like it when people come to my house. But whatever this new norm is, I think I've gotten a bit used to it. I really do enjoy connecting with people on Zoom. I've FaceTime with my family more than I've ever before. Um, and so I think that for me, being connected to people in these times really is about intention. You know, making sure that I call people back, making sure that I check in on people, making sure that I set plans and I keep them. Um, and to some degree, the virus and everything have kept me really honest in that I've made myself available to my community. And so I would say, I think what Julia is doing is really great in terms of like driving around and being safe. And uh, can you drop me off a tamale? I love that <laughs> you're in. <laughs> I must say, some people are asking for the recipe and I'm sorry, it's an Alain Delgado special. Uh, but if Sam wants to publish it, maybe we'll give it to you. <laughs> there we'll go. <laughs> But I'll bring you some tamale sawa. <laughs> I'm not far from you, so. <laughs> I know, you're right in Fort Greene, good. Okay, it's set, you're on the list. And then you take a left and then you can drive all the way to Nashville and I'll take a few too, okay. a few dozen. <laughs> right around the corner. Right around the corner. <laughs> yeah, see, could you tell us a little bit about your, what your family's traditions and 
how you feel about tradition and Thanksgiving or if it's sort of, you know, what Julia is talking about her trying something new most years, uh, sort of a turning tradition in some ways. What about yourself? Yeah, I grew up in Seattle also. Um, and I, what's up? Uh, I um, grew up going to Thanksgiving at my grandmother's house with you know, 30 plus people always. Uh, my mom and I always made the dinner rolls and we made them the day of Thanksgiving. So we would like get up in the morning and rush and make these dinner rolls. We always made the ones from the um, the the red and white plaid Betty Crocker cookbook. I'm sure a lot of people have that on their shelf somewhere. Um, and, you know, we'd spend the whole morning making the rolls together and kind of like leave the kitchen in a disaster and go over to grandma's house and um, we always had a pretty traditional meal, you know, sweet potatoes with marshmallows and mashed potatoes and turkey. I do remember that my uncle Dan, who loved to fish, would always make these really delicious pickled shrimp as the appetizer. I know some people are like against Thanksgiving appetizers, but I always loved those so much. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, you know, grew up with a traditional Thanksgiving and the Thanksgiving that I've had for the last few years has also been fairly uh, traditional except instead of dinner rolls now I make like six pies. <laughs> are there any snacking cakes on your menu this year? Are you snacking cake to out for the year? I can never have enough so I think I will probably make cake for dessert because I can make it the day before and it's still delicious and probably even better than it would be the day of. And Manit how about you? Well, I grew up in India, so Thanksgiving was definitely not, uh, you know, celebrated over there. But I remember uh, when I came here um, to go to school, um, I was one of the few students who did not go home for Thanksgiving break. So one of the faculty members invited me and I was just blown away by the, just the spread on the table. Right. And I was like, OK, so this is a festival which celebrates family. Uh, everybody is so loud. There is too much food. I'm like, this is any Indian festival. So right now, what I've been doing is, especially with, with the kids, right? I, I want to keep, I want to make Thanksgiving traditions because it's something that, you know, there isn't a tradition which has been passed down to me. So for the kids, I am creating that. And again, uh, you know, uh, giving a liberal dosage of my, you know, my roots. So there is a tandoori turkey on our table, which has, you know, uh, biryani stuffing in it. And there is a punch puran cranberry chutney. There is a coconut um, green bean um, saute. So I pretty much stick to whatever are the traditional Thanksgiving fixings on the table and then just go ahead and spice it up. Perfect. I love that. That's how that's that's how I had Thanksgiving growing up. Also, sticky rice stuffing with Chinese sausage, and um, I want to go to your things. I want to go to everybody's things. I want to I want, go to yours. I want a turkey tamale. I want a tandoori turkey. I want six pies from Yasi and cake. Amazing. Next year, maybe when things are normal, we should do just a giant Thanksgiving potluck. All of us get our get our signatures. That seems perfect. Balance out this year. A lot, a lot, a lot of people. I love that. And touching on that, my, you know, my next question is really about, you know, how we build that sense of connection in a year where many of us can't be physically with the ones we love. And Sam touched on this, that this Thanksgiving you see 29 people. And Minnie, in your book, in Chat, which is incredibly transportive, you take us on this amazing journey with you crisscrossing India on its rail system. And you talk about how for many Indians, one single bite of chat can conjure their boundless love for their homeland. So my question is really in a year that we can't be traveling, what are some ways we can still feel connected to our home and the people who, who represent home? 
I think uh, to me, what is most, in, uh, you know, what has been the most incredible part about food is that it's such a sensory experience, right? You, there are certain smells, there are a certain tastes which just transport you to, you know, maybe your childhood or maybe a place that you have visited. And I think that is a great way to travel the world by having a really amazing and an international, uh, you know, Thanksgiving table right they can be uh, you know they can be a moroccan couscous which could be you know uh, the stuffing or they can be an indian flair or uh, italian i think that is a great way to travel the world while still being at your uh, dining table so yeah sounds amazing and sam you talked about your 29 guests usually what are you doing this year to stay connected with your, your friends and family? What's your Thanksgiving going to look like? It's going to look a little strange. It's going to look small and pared down. Um, there, I, I don't even know if I can cook it small. I think it will, <laughs> we'll have very many leftovers from, from all that we're doing. I think that what I'd like to try to do is see if there isn't a way to somehow have a socially distanced moment before the meal where I'm thinking of just shucking a ton of oysters and kind of arranging them on the stoop or something and people can come by, friends can come by and each family can, can you know, attack some oysters and then we kind of talk from six or eight feet apart and then people go back. But then, you know, the governor has said we can't gather inside or outside in groups of more than 10 and so maybe that's not even gonna work. And so I think I'll probably take a page out of Hawa's playbook and be intentional about my, my use of this new and sort of bothersome technology that weighs us down at work, but allows us outside of work to, to stay connected with family in a way that we can't on the telephone. I think that we're all so tired, those of us who work in offices or in newsrooms or virtual newsrooms are so tired of Zoom by the end of the day that we just want to get like, I'm now talking, trying to talk on the phone with colleagues rather than using Zoom. And it occurs to me that if I do that more intentionally, then maybe Zoom could be this great pleasure for me at the end of the day with family. And I think, I, I, uh, I think we reported today that Zoom is taking down the, the paywall on Thanksgiving day so that free users can use it for more than 40 minutes without getting shut off. And so I think I'll probably set a place at the table for my uh, MacBook Air and we'll uh, talk to some family around the country. How about that? I like that. I know uh, my husband's family for Passover this year. There we, had, we went to a lot of Passover Zooms and it was really, really fun. It's something everyone is adapting to and you really do as how it's that like you're seeing people that you wouldn't normally if you had to travel maybe um so there, it just opens up more opportunities i think it changes how you set the table you're gonna have to set the table so everybody's eating on one side of the table right or in like bleachers yeah <laughs> like, family of four <laughs> <laughs> How, how about yourself? You, you touched us on this a little bit before, but how do you um, how do you think you'll find yourself connecting to your loved ones over Thanksgiving? Um, I think like Sam said, I'll spend a lot of time on Zoom and FaceTime and Google Hangout this year. Um, I'm also going to be outside in nature in Fort Greene Park walking, and so I'll be FaceTiming from there. Um, I'm I might walk over the Manhattan Bridge and walk back home and FaceTime that way, like take people on like a little tour with me. My family lives in Oslo. And so when it's like 7 a.m. here, it's like 2, 2 p.m. there or 1 p.m. And so they're ahead and it's an easier way to like connect and, you know, they're like winding down and I'm starting my day. So I might do a bit of that, but Mostly I'll probably be at home cooking for myself and my partner and having my goddaughter on FaceTime with me as she cooks for her family. And Yossi, it's nice to catch that 2 p.m. Oslo sunset. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
You know, the sun goes down at 2 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> and Yasi, how about yourself? Yeah, I haven't spent um, Thanksgiving with my family in a number of years, I think, basically, since I moved to New York. Um, so I'm, I'm not missing seeing them because I normally don't. So, you know, I'll make some phone calls and say hello and um, do some FaceTime with my brother and his daughters. And then um, the folks that I usually spend Thanksgiving with, we've got a, a cocktail hour all set up on Zoom. So I think we're going to be doing the same thing as everyone else for cheersing to our computers and, you know, just trying to stay as connected as we can. And Julia, you mentioned your tamales. How many tamales are, are, are going with you in the car? What, is, the what are we talking about? Yeah, uh, yeah, like over a hundred. <laughs> um, so we'll be spending Thanksgiving day making them uh, and prepping all that. But I don't want to be the downer or seem antisocial here, but part of what can be stressful about Thanksgiving is the big family gatherings <laughs> and family dynamics. Um, and a lot of people are alone this year. And for those who don't want to be, you know, certainly all, all tips for staying connected are welcome, but, um, you know, maybe enjoy that. Maybe enjoy not seeing your family <laughs> and just use it as sure. a time to relax. I, that's fair. Yeah, that's <laughs> very fair. And I love that you said that because you read my mind or you read my outline for this <laughs> event. Because the next thing I wanted to talk about is stress or really how not to stress because the holiday, you know, it's all about the food and the gathering, but someone's got to make the food, someone's got to plan. And for some, as you said, being around your family can actually be quite stressful. And Julia, um, in your book, Good Drinks, you know, you describe yourself as a bon vivant who wants to be vivant without alcohol. And I love that because I think anyone who spent any time not drinking alcohol for whatever reason, you realize the fun doesn't necessarily come from the glass or a drink that takes your mental, emotional edge off, that fun and that power to distress within you. Um, so I'd love to hear from you and from, from others ideas for how to lower the stress level around the holidays and live that bon vivant Thanksgiving life. And I think, you know, as you, touching on like maybe enjoying that time alone um, without a big crowd is, is something that would work for, for some. But. Yeah, I mean, I'll just start since we're on me a bit like, yeah. I'm not pushing my book or my current lifestyle on anyone, but I would venture to say that if you if you are with family this year <laughs> and if yours um, is a family with complicated dynamics, I may be giving things away by how much I'm referencing this, but um, <laughs> you know, alcohol uh, can tend to add fuel to the fire. So um, maybe a way to um, de-stress is to make a non-alcoholic drink or maybe keep the holiday alcohol free. Um, you know, I wouldn't, take issue with somebody going the complete other route, um, but it's just an idea. One of the things that um, I have long believed about Thanksgiving is that like the most important thing to remember is everything's going to be fine. It's going to be great. Just take a deep breath, plan your play, play your plan, cook the stuff, get it out. Everything's going to be fine. And the things that bring stress, like your drunk uncle, <laughs> you gotta be you gotta be kind of copacetic with that as well. You're never gonna change someone's mind about politics, about faith, about anything on Thanksgiving Day. So just let it ride. Have you been meditating, Sam? Oh yeah, this is my. <laughs> this is, this is, this is very is, much coming from a place of acceptance. Exactly. <laughs> Life is suffering. Steer into it. It's going to be fine. Just Julia, have you seen 2020? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would like uh, Sam's voice saying it's going to be okay as my ringtone. I wish I had recorded that. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore your drunk uncle. <laughs> well, it's a, or don't engage. You know, I I I always think you know. There was a time when 
right at that moment when people stopped, before people mostly stopped smoking, they stopped smoking indoors and then they smoked outdoors. And like there was, and I remember there were these issues at some Thanksgivings about smoking. And I was like, come on, man. If there are smokers, they're going to smoke. So put an ashtray on the porch and or on the stoop or wherever and just chill. You can't expect the smoker not to smoke on Thanksgiving. You can't expect your crazy politics uncle to, to not have crazy politics on Thanksgiving. So take a deep breath, pour the guy a drink. Doesn't have to be an alcoholic drink, Julia. <laughs> and enjoy yourself. Everything's going to be cool. I would add yeah, but, that. Sorry, oh, sorry. I would add to that when it comes to the food, getting away from the idea that things need to be perfect. You know, like food is meant to be enjoyed, but if you mess something up, giving yourself space to make up for that, if you need to, if it's too salty, adding more water, um, you know, if your rice is not fluffy enough, maybe having a paper towel soaking up the moisture, like just relax. <laughs> this idea that things need to be perfect when it comes to food is so mind boggling to me coming from places where food is meant to be enjoyed with other people. Okay. I want to hear what Yasi has to say about this because this is why I don't bake because a lot of food can be saved. Can't fix a pie. Can't fix a pie that, <laughs> cake that doesn't, you know, cross your fingers, put it in the oven. It's true. You kind of don't know if you've messed up until the very end, but ice cream and whipped cream can solve a lot of problems. <laughs> and also, if your pie is so bad that you don't want to eat it, just eat the ice cream and the whipped cream and it's fine. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. It's just food. That's a really good tip, actually. I think it's really important that we underscore this a lot tonight because one of the things that has occurred to me recently is that though this very different Thanksgiving is going to mean that we aren't gathering in the in, to celebrate the traditions that we have for years by going to our grandparents, to our parents, to our cousins, to our friends. One of the things that's going to mean is that many, many more Americans than maybe ever before are going to be cooking Thanksgiving for the very first time, mm. right? I mean, I'm, I'm imagining Yasi like, I don't know how to make a turkey. I just make dinner rolls and, and cakes. Um, which I've is, already course, made two Thanksgivings. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying there's someone out there who has for 20 years always made one side dish for a Thanksgiving. And then now for the first time, it's like cooking a turkey and the side dish and the other side dish and the pie. And they're going to be nervous, but we got to tell them this panel's got to tell them everything's going to be okay. And I think like a lot of other things in the age of COVID, you know, the, the elements that are most important to you will rise to the top. Like maybe it's not, maybe you're not going to have a turkey and that's okay. Maybe you realize like, hey, I never even really liked turkey that much. I just want to <laughs> eat the stuffing and the mashed potatoes. And, and if I'm going to cook Thanksgiving this year, that's, I'm going to do only the things that I like. Um, but I do next want to talk about the food and the dishes on the table. And Sam, you you wrote a book on Thanksgiving. In the book, you said, you know, you want to make it possible for people to cook Thanksgiving without losing their minds. <laughs> what do you, in writing this book, what did what did you find that people sort of got them were most worried about? Like, what were the thing? Like, what? What were the things that sort of they got the most wrong about things they were they're most sort of stressed about and I think they're um, most stressed about the bird. I mean, they open the refrigerator. There's essentially like a toddler in the refrigerator and they're like, I have to cook that? Like it's huge. And they're they're really freaked out about it. And maybe justifiably, because they you know, they, they look at the food pornography that we all create professionally and they see these beautifully burnished birds and they hear that like the breast meat is perfect and the thigh meat is perfect at the same time. And they, and they worry about it and they needn't 
really. It's pretty difficult to screw up a turkey if you have a, a digital instant read thermometer to keep track of the, of the internal temperature of the bird. And then, wow, it's done. And it can rest for a long time while you start freaking out about the gravy. I see in the chat, there are lots of people who freak out about gravy. But again, there's no need to freak out about the gravy. It's mostly there. You're just adding a thickener to it in the form generally of flour and making sure that you create this roux in there. And then you're adding a liquid that then magically turns into this elixir that you can um, flavor as you like. Um, it's really, people freak out about the bird, they needn't. So in this group, are people pro brining or no brining? I, I have a lot to say, can I keep going? Yeah. <laughs> I think I think the brine no brine thing is like um, is like uh, skirt lengths or or the width of ties. You know, it comes in and out of fashion. But the fact of the matter is, you know, if you kind of dry brine it, put some salt on the exterior for a while, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. There's no reason to be like I need a food grade compound bucket, and I'm gonna create this thing, and I'm gonna change the ice all the time. I don't think um, I don't think you need to brine, particularly not this year. Okay, so no brine, no brine, or if you brine, dry brine. Does anyone else have feelings about about that? But they're I actually I don't brine. I marinate. I marinate it in uh, ginger garlic paste with uh, yogurt. So uh, add just a touch of raw papaya, and and those act as oh. tenderizers. And uh, and that that also helps keeping it really nice and moist. It's that's how we make kebab. So I just put that philosophy into making a turkey, and it has worked so far. Wow, that sounds good. Oh. Thank I you. You're invited, and all of you. <laughs> Nashville band. All right, and so cranberry sauce, canned or homemade? Homemade. I see the okay, neat. What's your homemade? Homemade. Only? only homemade. I make a chutney. It is Talk a chutney. Your chutney. I put I in put Thai spice in it. Oh. Hala, I saw some. Do you have cranberry feeling? I don't really have big cranberry feelings, but I make it's a it's a chutney, so I make lots of chutneys. I obviously have a sauce company, so. <laughs> No cans here. I'm not against cans, though. I'm a can cran, cran girl. <laughs> okay, I so love the Jen, slices. <laughs> you go slices. I, had. I like the slices. I it's I that's the only cranberry sauce I know, and I and I like it. Own it. Own yeah. it. I love it. I do. I am. I I think um, I think this I think I I think sliced canned cranberry is legit. I have an issue with the with the just dumping it out of the can because that's big dog food vibes for me. And <laughs> I just slice it so it leaves slicing like, seems <laughs> legitimate. Like, <laughs> okay, I'll admit, you know, risk. I'll admit this here, and this is like the Scandinavian part of me, but I go to IKEA for their cranberry on the side of like the the chicken. I I mean I make a trip there like every other month just for that. That's awesome. All right, that is a hot tip. I can't very soft. I love that. Okay, stuffing. Or Yasi, cranberry. Oh, I was just I was just gonna say that um like in a traditional Thanksgiving spread, cranberries are like the only thing that are like bright and acidic and tart, and so. They've always been like my very favorite part of the meal. And they're also very easy to make if you're a not a canned cranberry person. Like all you really need is a bag of cranberries and some sugar. It's nice if you have some ginger or cinnamon stick or some orange zest, but all you really need is some cranberries and sugar. It's pretty easy. Totally. I, see, I see in the chat that someone said that homemade cranberry and canned cranberry are like completely separate items. I think that's probably true. So stuffing, cornbread, white bread, any stuffing feelings? First of all, 
from red dressing because <laughs> i think like stuffing right putting sure. it, you just don't get enough you don't get enough of it a b it, it slows down it kind of it, it compromises the cooking time on the on the bird i find mm -hmm. and i like the word dressing because it's you know because we think of dressing as a salad dressing and then all of a sudden it's like a peculiar americanism to say here's some dressing you know like <laughs> that's stuffing but it isn't because it's not stuffed in, in the bird um does anyone actually do stuffing like stuff it in the bird or is everyone a dressing on the sad person I, I stuff it in the bird but then i do a rice it's so it's like it's almost like a biryani. Biryani, which is a steamed it's a biryani yeah oh. So, so that it's so it just like steams in it and and that it works very well oh my god that sounds good someone yeah, Manit's Sam, gonna have a line gonna... outside of her house next thanksgiving yeah. <laughs> so welcome more the merrier <laughs> like next year like one of the food magazines or new times like needs to do Manit's thanksgiving spread just yeah i just get out there i just assigned it to kim severson over the chat so it's done <laughs> Nobody, no, 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 no. we got that sam are you are you a, a cornbread or a uh like a sourdough like white loaf we um or, I do a, dressing person um don't profile me um i uh i um i do do a a, a cornbread one uh most often with with peppers and, and chorizos but i like um i like a country loaf one um Particularly, I, I do one sometimes with oysters, where I really kind of want the oysters um, to, to stand out. Um, I've done clams and chiriquo, the uh, Portuguese um, uh, chorizo. Um, that's a delicious one. Um, I think all the dressings are great, but none better than Manit's. All right, so I was just, we have fifteen minutes left. So we're gonna open it up to the Q&A and I have some questions lined up from the audience that, that came through. Um, all right, what do you make out of leftover turkey or I would just say leftovers in general the next day? Do you guys, any of you have leftover secrets or brilliant ideas? You gotta start Pitatas. with does. Go ahead, Sam. Sorry. Well, it's not gonna be as good as yours, Mini. <laughs> I was just going to say, I just like, I make frittatas. I make like Indian, uh, Indian spiced frittatas and just put the turkey in it. And next day's brunch is done. I make a turkey a la king. And mm. that's a way of using up some of the gravy and the turkey, and then maybe make uh, biscuits and serve the turkey a la king over the biscuit. And it's like you're in nursery school or something. It's like baby food. It's just for, the, for those who aren't super familiar with, with Chicken a la king. What can you talk? The turkey a la king is actually just um, chicken a la king, which is essentially just shredded cooked chicken in a creamy sauce and almost like a velouté or something. Um, Im imagine just dumping a lot of gravy, like so much gravy, onto a bunch of shredded up um, um, leftover turkey and eating that over toast. And how good you would feel about mm. yourself and your choices if you did that. All right, anyone else? Leftover love? I'm a big fan of uh, taking some stuffing and or dressing and frying it in a pan for breakfast with an egg on top. That's my favorite Ooh. Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Get that crispy crunchy boring thing in this on. realm. I just feel like I reheat the, the leftovers and eat them on a plate. I, you know, maybe add some hot sauce to wake it all up. But I also, my my answer would have been boring to all the hot takes because I have none. I kind of, I, I like everything if it's done well. Uh, so, and if Thanksgiving dinner is done well, then it's, it's good reheated. <laughs> you can waffle it too. Ooh, yeah. Waffle up some dressing. Okay, so our next question um, is for Yasi, but I think we can, Yasi, you can start and we can open it up as well. How do you prepare traditional desserts for Thanksgiving or do you veer from the usual pies for something different? I know you earlier said you, you do a lot of pies and 
What are you thinking? Yeah, Thanksgiving is generally a pie, pie forward dessert for for me. Um, I usually make like six pies for like twelve people. <laughs> um, but you know the classics: pumpkin apple, pecan, and I always make. Uh, two lemon meringue because my crew really loves lemon meringue and are you whipping are you making whipped cream like fresh for everybody yeah it's not I mean it's a nice little break after dinner you can whip it by hand get a little a, lot. Get a little exercise you can go do it outside if you need a breather I love that what does everyone else do for a dessert this is the one thing to which I'm married is pecan pie <laughs> from my Virginian grandmother who made it every Thanksgiving. And I, I really can't have a Thanksgiving without it. Hard to agree. Got to have a pecan pie, got to have an apple pie. Pumpkin? I'm going to stick on the, on the pumpkin pie, but everybody wants it. So that's got to be there as well. My best friend's father makes a sweet potato pie. And if I don't go to Seattle, he ships it out to me the week before. So, <laughs> wow. Yes. So I, um, I, a couple of years back, heard about the chur pumper, right, uh, which is uh, all of the different pies baked in cakes. And I, as uh, for one Thanksgiving, just as a gag, I'm like, you want pies and cake? It's all in one. And now it's become a kind of a funny tradition to have it on the Thanksgiving table. So it's everything in one slice. <laughs> Guys, that sounds amazing. Again, can I come to you? I'd be happy to come to your thing. <laughs> Always open doors. Our next question is now that I've been hosting and making all the food for five years, can I start to innovate a little on my mother in law's recipes? She and my mother will be the only guests besides my immediate family. I'm ready, but what if they're not? So it's a little bit of the tradition versus innovation question. Yeah, she's been at it five years. It's hers now. Like, I, I don't like, you don't have to go out of your way and be aggressive toward your mother-in-law. But you can, you can start, you can start taking, making some money moves after five years. The judge has ruled, <laughs> but maybe you guys feel differently. But I, 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 I encourage some movement now at five years. And your mother-in-law might be more open this year than any other because of everything that's happened. So just a gentle nudge. And the next question is, what is the most memorable Thanksgiving dish you've each cooked or eaten? You've each cooked what? That you've each cooked or eaten. Most memorable dish, Thanksgiving dish. Oh, that's a tough one. They're all so memorable. Oof. All right, I'll go. Um, um, as some of you may know, I'm I'm very anti um, uh, appetizer at Thanksgiving. I'm not. I didn't work all day making this meal, so you could eat half a pound of nuts before sitting down at the table and refusing seconds. So I don't tend to put out things, but I do think there can be a place for like a, a soup or a bisque. And one year, my father um, brought to Thanksgiving um, um, like, a, like a seafood bisque, clams with uh, some oysters, some lobster. And, and it was despite this description, bisque, seafood, quite light and we ate it just as, as the turkey was resting and it was really remarkable. We'd never done that before and it, it kind of haunts me. I've never done it since and my dad's dead now and maybe I got to bring that back. Um, but speaking honestly, that's what jumped into my head as the most memorable Thanksgiving meal or dish I've had. I'll go the other way. That was like a, that's a lovely memory. Um, in 2011, when 
honestly, I'm not even sure I was like eating food or enjoying food the way that I do now. A friend asked me to bake a, um, a bread pudding. <laughs> I think they're still confused as into how I got into food. <laughs> That's, I'll never forget it. <laughs> I blame it on the recipe. <laughs> it's definitely the recipe's fault. Probably the editor's fault. It's okay. <laughs> this isn't a dish, but Sam's comment about nuts before dinner is reminding me of another tradition we do have in my household that I let go of, but I think I want to bring back, which is I have such sweet memories being with my grandfather, um, who I loved, who was just truly a gentleman. Um, uh, taking pistachios like in the shell, eating them by the fire, throwing the shells into the fire and hearing them crackle. And it was just me and him. And I felt like such a grown up for getting to engage in this with him. Um, so maybe I'll get some pistachios and have them before dinner. I'm sorry, Sam. Uh, I, um, that story is so good. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and since the next day, I have mole to make to go with the tamales. Any pistachios not eaten by the only two people who will be here will be ground up into sauce. Nice. Yeah, see? Um, there's this dish that my, um, my friend Carol makes that's pearled onions cooked with like an incredible amount of butter and currants. And I think there's thyme in there. And it's like the simplest thing that I would never make or eat any other time of year but she makes it every thanksgiving and it's like my favorite thing on the plate oh that sounds delicious that sounds amazing yeah. yum all right manit just dunk on us now <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we uh to me one of my favorite things is something that we do serve at the restaurant because we are open for thanksgiving for you know people who are away from their family or you know, for takeout and stuff. We do, uh, um, because we can't do an entire turkey, we do a turkey roulade. And uh, that is, again, stuffed with biryani, but we top it up with um, uh, tikka masala sauce. So it's like a turkey tikka masala. And that is like one of my favorite things to eat. It's just, and, and the roulade is, it's batter fried, it's deep fried. So uh, oh. it's like, Okay. Yeah, of course. Everything, like everything, like indulgent is is on that, and that's one of my favorite things. Why roast it when you can deep fry it? <laughs> wow, we add more restaurant. yumminess to it and texture. Please forward my mail to Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> Done. <laughs> wow, Mini, which of your restaurants does this? Uh, Chohan Elin Masala House. All right. So next year, Thanksgiving at your house, and then the next year at the restaurant. We'll just get it from the restaurant. It'll be all on the table. All right, we have a question about Brussels sprouts. And I think this can also sort of expand into a question, a question about vegetables in general. Um, at Thanksgiving, vegetables, yay or nay? Brussels sprouts, yay or nay? Or, Green, yeah. green, bean people, green bean people or Brussels sprouts people? Brussels. Both. Brussels. Yeah. I like that bitterness in there in the mix. Brussels? Yeah. I like a, a crunchy green bean. Yeah, legit. Both. Both. Yeah. Like, I love a soft green bean. I, <laughs> I love the, I'm like the, tea, the Thanksgiving TV dinner. <laughs> <laughs> like, and cranberry like sauce, soft, soft creamy. I love the soft, the soft creamy green bean. Um, so in our last few minutes, um, I would love to do, you know, the classic Thanksgiving question of talking a little bit about gratitude um, and what each of you are uh, feel grateful for this year. How do you want to start? Sure. Um, I am incredibly grateful for my community here in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. I feel deeply rooted um, in the people that I have found here. 
being far away from home, it's really served me to just have people who look out for me on a daily basis. Um, I'm also just thankful for my family made. My best friends are people who show up day in and day out. Um, and then ultimately I'm thankful to be able to share food waste from home with people here and that there is a space now in which I can live in and um, exist in. So yeah, I, I'll say for a, such a random year, um, I'm thankful for all that's come out of it that's good. Manit, how about you? Um, this year, I'm, I'm so grateful for I mean, you know, the health of my family and friends, I think that that is paramount. Um, but so grateful for my incredible team who has like literally worked in the trenches uh, with me through this, this crazy time. I am thankful for all, the kindness of all of the guests who have supported us, you know, in, in the darkest of times and who continue to support us, which is absolutely incredible. Um, I am grateful that my book chart is out. It's, it's been a nine year, uh, it, it, was, it was an idea which came to us around nine years back. So, uh, so just to have, uh, it's got, and it's got very personal stories. So um, just very grateful for that. And uh, at this present moment, grateful to be sharing all of this with uh, y'all and just, uh, just like, just the sense of community and camaraderie is something that keeps me pushing uh, myself to go on ahead. So yeah, thank y'all. Cassie? Yeah, I think I'll kind of echo what everyone else has said so far that I'm so thankful for for my community and for the support of my community um, and for the health, most importantly, for the health of my, my family and friends during this really um, kind of scary time. You know, I'm, I'm just glad that everyone is, is safe and, and healthy. Julia? I go last. I'm capping it off. Pen penultimate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I mean, again, to echo people, uh, you know, the basic things that aren't so basic for so many people. Um, I'm healthy. I have a roof over my head. I, I can do work from home. Um, the privilege of writing this book, which has really made a lot of people feel seen who don't drink um, and, and feel excited and um, feel like they have permission to drink something adult. Um, and I'm thankful that, oh, I, I romantic love entered my life and I have a COVID love story. That's the cliffhanger I'll leave you on. <laughs> Stay tuned for our Valentine's panel. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, how about you? Oh, I wasn't last. Sorry, Sam. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for the health of my family. I'm thankful um, to be employed and I'm thankful to the New York Times for the work that we've been able to do remotely for eight months now. Um, I'm thankful to my colleagues at NYT Cooking um, and, you know, thankful to be alive. Um, but I guess the way, maybe this is the way we should end things, Jen, is that I think I speak on behalf of everyone on this panel that we're thankful to Penguin Random House for, for publishing us um, and making this evening possible at this crazy time. Um, and I hope we can, I really hope we can gather together in Nashville to celebrate um, the success of this panel, the success of our books um, and um, the return to normalcy sometime in 2021. I will hold you really, all to it, I promise you. That was a really wonderful way of putting it. And Manit, we are totally, definitely going to take you up on your offer. And I just want to thank all of you for taking the time out of this very, your very busy lives, promoting your books and spending time with your family for this panel. Um, again, these books are amazing. This is In Didi's Kitchen from Kala. This is Snacking Cakes from Yassi. Chat and good drinks 
and see you on Sunday with Sam and Thanksgiving, which everyone should have in their back pocket for any Thanksgiving. Um, thank you all so much. And thank you for everyone out there for, for tuning in. And I really wish everyone a very happy and healthy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Good night. Bye.